Okay, I'm going to start out this morning by, or this afternoon by uh, talking about the assignment. So just a few points. The assignment demos are Thursday in the labs. Okay. So uh, those of you that are, those of you that have done the game of life assignment, you need to demo that on Thursday, and that needs to be submitted on Thursday. If you're doing the Imagine Cup project, you don't need to submit until Friday. So submit everything you're submitting to the Imagine Cup project for me. If you're on a team with uh, a number of different people, just one person needs to submit everything through web courses. But everybody else needs to submit uh, just a note in web courses to say that you're part of a team and that their stuff is in somebody else's submission. There's also a Google Docs form that everybody on the team needs to fill out. And it's your kind of declaration as to what your contribution to the project was and what everybody else's contribution to the project was. Anything else we need to say? Uh, that's pretty much it on the submission and the demos. I'll grade all of the assignments, even though you'll do your demo for possibly whoever's in the lab. Anyone that's doing a team, I need to see your demo as well um, as the person who's in the lab, because I, I just want to be fair to everybody. Uh, so that's, that's the next thing. The, the next thing is, I hesitate to even ask if anybody hasn't started yet. I presume you are all finished at this stage. If you haven't started, it's a bit serious because I did give the assignment down in the middle of December and it's now nearly March. So if you, if you still have work to do on the assignment, um, you need to maybe have to think about what your level of engagement with the course is and if it's something that you need to work on this semester. So what I did think I might do today because I... Uh, I just want to basically spend about 10 minutes, just if you haven't started the assignment, it is doable within the space of about two hours, if you can program. If you can't program, you'll never be able to do it, right? Yeah? How do I just 50% just get working and then yeah. the features, not 50%? Yeah. The features are the top of this. So I gave a list of proposed ones. I have also, in the marking scheme, which I've given to all the lab tutors, I've given what I think each of those extra features is worth. So. Um, the things that you might want to do, for example, loading and saving the game board will be one thing. Creating the creatures, you get some marks for doing that. Uh, doing a 3D game of life, changing the rules, adding colors, adding sound effects. Um, there are a couple of ones that I came up with, but I've seen some of the other ones. You know, you'll come up with your own ideas, I hope, when you start uh, getting the core game of life working. You'll then see the potential of it to do other, other things. Does that give you some ideas? Yeah. What about if you attempt that, but you don't get it like Finished. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I do think you should be able to get it finished, right? Even if the, the, just the extra stuff, the bonus. What's that? Just you, the bonus stuff. If you don't get all, oh, of course, you get marks for absolutely everything you do. But I do expect you to spend. Um, well, I mean, it depends. You know, some people might get it done in a few hours and might get all the extra stuff done in, in, in maybe a day, you know, and you might be finished it, and that's great. In fact, you can get the whole thing. You can get, you know, you can get a very high mark in this assignment if you can program. If you're a good programmer, you can get a high mark in this assignment by doing a couple of hours or three hours, maybe. You know, you'll get loads. That's all it took me to get my sort of little demo thing working, right? Um, I know that there's much better programmers than me in the class, so I know a lot of you or some of you out there will have done much more than I have done, and that's 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 to, um, you know that's great. Um, on the other hand, if it's something that you need to go over and, and spend a good bit of time. Revising all the programming we've done for the last two years, then of course it's going to take you a couple of weeks to get it done because you've got a lot of more work to do. You have to basically bring yourself up to the level where you can do this in a couple of hours first. So um, that's what I think. <coughs> I don't want to go on too much about that. I think you should. Everyone should be able to do it at this stage of your programming career. So, but just in case you are not one, not a hundred percent sure how to get started, um, in the next five minutes we'll set up the game board and we'll plot a few points on the screen and then after that, I'm not going to make this code available, so take notes if you want, right? Um, so, if you think about what the game of life is, hopefully, I don't even, I, maybe this is irrelevant, maybe most of you, you know, hopefully you, you, this is just pointless, like you're already there, but, so, but if you're not, if you think about it, the game of life is a 2D board, all right? So you have a grid of cells like this, by the way, don't even attempt to do this or even start this assignment until you read all the documents that I gave links to, particularly the Wikipedia one. The Wikipedia article tells you everything you need to know about the game of life. It's a 2D board, okay? It's a grid like this. So we're going to use a 2D array of Booleans. This is the way I solved it. If you wanted to do it differently, you could use a 2D array and each one of these cells can be a cell class. That's another approach and that's fine. If you want to store more information, like 
which generation it's part of, then you might want to make this a 2D array of cell class. That's fine. I don't mind what way you solve it. But basically, to do the sort of very basic uh, game of life, it's going to be a 2D array of booleans. So each cell could be alive or dead. Each cell could be, we might say, alive is equal to true and dead is equal to false. We've got a 2D uh, game board here. Um, how do you do 2D arrays in C sharp? They're specified in row column order, um, which is slightly counterintuitive because we're used to thinking of, you know, these are the rows, row by row, column by column. But when you're doing a 2D array, it's it's actually y comma x because you're talking about which row you're talking about. So that's your y number, and then the second variable is which column you're talking about. So that's really your x number. So that's one little small thing to keep in mind about 2D arrays. Um, one thing about the game of life, which if you've worked on it yourself, you probably discovered this the hard way, which is the right way to do it, and that's that you need to keep two game boards, and you swap them. So basically, each time around in your update, you take the game board, a whole load of if statements, counting the number of cells that are alive around each cell, applying the rules, is there two alive, is there three alive, is there four alive, or whatever, and then you decide whether you're gonna turn on the cell in the next generation. And, um, and then you swap them. So then the next one becomes the current one, the current one becomes the one that you're, you're updating. So you kind of constantly swap them in and out. So you apply the rules to this, and it tells you which cells to turn on in this one. And then you swap them around. So then the other thing is you have to draw the game board. So drawing the game board is going to be a nested for loop. So you've got something that goes row by row, column by column, decides whether a cell is turned on or not, and then you have to decide, well, where am I going to draw it? So if you want to use a single little texture, let's say you want to use a little um, square texture, all right? So this is going to have a width and a height, right? It might be five pixels by five pixels. So then you take the row multiplied by the height, and you take the column multiplied by the width, and that tells you what's the x and y coordinate that you need to draw it at. Because each one of these is going to be, so that's going to start at zero, then that's going to be five, 10, 15, 20, and that's how you calculate where to draw in the sprite. So, um, that's, anything else we need to say about that? That's, that's the core of it. In the middle here somewhere, in your update method, um, you're going to have uh, something, I would advise you to write a method to count the number of cells surrounding a cell, and if you think about it, if we were looking at this current cell, if that's row and column, then this here is going to be row minus one, this is row plus one, this is going to be column plus one, and this is column minus one. And that's how you figure out the row and column of the surrounding cells. And you go through eight, you're going to have eight if statements, going through each of the surrounding ones. And that's pretty much it. Now that's an hour's work. Uh, in fact, we'll, we'll set up the game board, turn on and turn off and draw the thing in the next 10 minutes. And then from there on, I'd say maybe another 45 minutes to do all the if statements. And there it is. That's your 50 marks. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> All right, so I am going to just create a new uh, project here, a new XA Game Studio project. I'm going to make it a Windows game, and I'm going to do this like as quickly and as as um, you know. This is not going to be the final version. I would say the right way to do this is to parameterize things a little bit more, and never to hard code values or things like that to put things into classes, but just to show you how to get started on it, and from here on in, it's up to yourself to take it to the next level, right? So I have a basic X and A game here that I've just created, got a blue screen there. First thing I might want to do is I'm gonna add the uh, 2D texture for, which I'm going to use to draw each cell. So you just click add existing item, and you go and find what it is you want to draw in at each cell. So I have, previously created a little bitmap here which is called white dot and uh, it's a BMP file so it's just it's just a square just a little square uh, BMP file and it's pure white okay so then the next thing I want to do in here can everybody see that okay I'll make it a bit bigger by the way interrupt me if you want to ask any questions if you don't understand something and you don't ask questions then that's not good. So I'll ask questions, right? That's what I'm here for. I get paid massively. You have no idea how much money the Institute of Technology pays me to answer your questions. And if you don't, then it's like it's like just giving me money for free. I I would never give money for free. Okay? So 
So make use of me. All right, so texture, and I'm going to call this uh, texture 2D, I'm just going to call it cell texture. All right, and we remember from the first semester to load up the texture in X and A, you put it into the load content method, and you go cell texture equals content dot load, you pass in texture 2D. Loads of examples uh, on the website which do this. Uh, white cell, what did I call it? It's white. Uh, I call that uh, white dot, okay? White, white dot. All right, you don't put the dot, uh, BNP extension. So that's it, that's the cell texture loaded, all right? Next thing I want to do is make my 2D array to, to store the game board, and I'm going to make that a field in my class. Again, if I was doing this, I, I, this is just for the demonstration, I would make a game board class. I wouldn't just put everything into the game class, all right? But just for now, I'm going to put everything into the game class, and you guys can work on it from there. So let's make a uh, bool array. So if you don't know how to do Boolean arrays in C Sharp, get on to Google, do uh, Let's see, we want to do a 2D array in C sharp. Oops, C sharp. Is it Alt 3? Uh. 2D array in C sharp declaration. And there you go. Tutorials left, right, and center. All right. Tells you how to set it up. So it's bool dot that is the way you do it, as far as I remember. Yeah. Okay, and let's call it a uh, game board. New, bool, and then you decide how many rows and columns you want to have in it. And uh, just thinking about it here, let's, let's, let's make these fields as well. Int rows equals 50, and int calls equals 50. So we'll go 50 by 50, right? So let's say, but really, the right way to do it is to load the texture. Figure out the width of the texture. Figure out the width of the screen. Divide one into the other, and that tells you how many rows you can fit on the screen and how many columns you can fit on the screen. <coughs> All right, so let's just go rows. Ah, oh, you can't do that anyway, so let's just do 50, 50, okay? So I've got 50 rows, 50 columns. That's my game board created. Down here, maybe I want to initialize my game board. So I typically write a method to do this, right? Write a method called clear game board or something like that, which clears the game board. But anyway, for, uh, we'll go row by row and column by column, right? Um, int row equals zero. So we're gonna go row by row. We're gonna go the whole row, which means we go column by column. Yeah, perfect. So int row equals zero, semicolon. Row is less than the rows. Semicolon, row, plus, plus. <coughs> and we put another one here which goes column by column. <coughs> Equal zero, semicolon, call, is less than calls. Semicolon, call, plus, plus. And we're basically called game board, at row, and column, is equals to false. So we initially turn everything off. All right. Why don't I turn a few of them on just so we can draw them? Okay. Game board. In fact, I'm going to draw a line in the middle of the game board. All right. And I'll use a little for loop to do that. For int uh, call equals ten semicolon call is less than twenty semicolon call plus equals to two. So I'll just draw. You know steps, right? So I won't even fill them all in, just so you can see some of them. Game board, uh, uh, let's pick row four, and down column is equal to true. So I've now turned a few of them on. Okay, so I've set my game board up, and I've turned a few of them on. Uh, I've cleared the game board, and I have turned a few of them on. So, so I should see some dots getting drawn on the screen. To draw the thing, I need another nested for loop, so why don't I just copy and paste this one. So I'm going to bring this down into the draw method here. And of course then you need to go sprite batch dot begin. And sprite batch dot end. 
Why are you giving me an error? There we go. All right. Okay, so I'm going row by row, column by column. I've loaded up the sprite. Let me figure out the width and the height of the sprite to figure out where I need to draw each of the cells on the screen. So I'm going to go int cell width. That's going to be equal to the width of the texture. And the texture I call that cell texture dot width. Int cell height. Oh, okay, H, W, H, T. It's going to be equal to cell texture dot height. So now we know the width and the height of each individual cell. Okay, and I've just gotten that from the sprite. All right, so if the sprite is 5 by 5, then it's going to be 5, 10, 15, 20, the X and Y coordinates on the screen to draw. So now I'm going row by row, column by column, and I'm going to draw some sprites on the screen. So it's sprite batch dot draw. The first parameter that we pass in here is the texture. So in other words, um, it's, it's the sprite that I want to draw, and I call that sprite. SP, oh, sorry, did I call it cell texture? On oh, the next next parameter, here, we'll use the position one. Okay. Um, and in fact, what I need to do is check to see if the cell is turned on, and I want to draw it in in black if it's turned on, or white if it's turned off. So, if Game board at position row, comma, call. All right, and it's a boolean, so that will do fine. I want to draw it in in black. Let me calculate the position here. So pause.x is going to be equals to the column multiplied by the uh, cell width. Pause.y is going to be equal to the column multiplied by the cell height. Alright, so that's my position calculated. Sorry, that should be the row, of course. Sprite batch.draw, cell texture. Next parameter is the position. Third parameter is which color I want to draw it in. Color.black if it's turned on. Else we'll draw it in uh, white. Color dot white. <coughs> Done. Now, so that's taken me all of, I'd say, ten minutes at most to set up the game board and draw it on the screen. And there we go. That's your game board set up, drawn. That's the two D array. Make a class, add some methods, put in the if statements, assignment done. Okay? Anybody have one? And now's your chance. Your assignment's due on Thursday. If you, if you have any questions, you can ask anything you like. If, if there's anything you want to ask, you like. what's that? How do you the lines? Uh, which lines? Oh, the lines. Uh, I don't know. Who did lines in their assignment? Yeah? Just, just make the position a bit bigger than the actual tile width. And height. So, so position X, position oh, Y, make it bit. That's a great idea. Use the, just, you just drew a border around each sprite as well. Uh, yeah, that's that's cool. Great idea. There's two suggestions. Number one, instead of just using a plain sprite, use a little box in a box. Another one, which I guess we can do really quickly. That's very clever, right? Just basically take the width plus one and the height plus one. And now we should get a little blue border around it. Awesome. Very clever, Dan. You're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that. You're a great programmer. Huh? Extra credit. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Look at that. How easy is that? Uh, okay. Anyone want to ask any questions? So I'll assume we'll see some beautiful life forms, artificial life forms. Maybe it will become self-aware. Skynet is what I'm looking for on Thursday, right? Lots of artificial life forms. And from there, you build on it, all right? Put in the rules, copy the arrays, everything else. That's it. I'm not going to make that code available, right? You can write it yourself. So the next thing then um, I thought we might do today then is just from yesterday's class, I went through all of the C-sharp topics which are going to come up in your lab test next week. 
there's a couple of little things which tend to confuse people that I kind of have in my own head that we might sort of do. But from yesterday's class, what what would you like me to what would you like me to go through today that, that it, you know for a fact is coming up in your lab test next week? Something about arrays. Remember you were saying you can use um, dot count on it. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, sure thing. So I'll just create a new project here. I'm going to call this, uh, oh yeah, just make it a, a console. That's, that's a fairly simple thing. That's only going to take us a, a minute or two, right? If you make an array in C sharp, uh, say you want to just make an array of ints. So you go int uh, a or or for array equals new, oops, sorry, int array equals new int I would say we make a hundred elements in that uh, in, in C of course you have to store the fact that you had a hundred elements in it and you could easily overwrite the end of it in C sharp you can't to get the array size just console right line a or or dot uh, count And that's a property. So, what's wrong now? That's my last thing. That's that kept happening to me. Yes. Yes, it's an it's an answer. Answer. Uh, huh? Isn't that how you get the size of an array? Maybe it isn't. But it's not a string. You can't print it out. Um, it should convert it. Well, we get past the template, but I don't think that works. Uh, maybe it's a method. Hmm. It's a method. It's not a property. So that will give you the count of it. For lists, I'm pretty sure that it's a property. You can go list int l equals new list of ints. That's interesting, isn't it? So arrays, it's a method on a list. It's a, that's a bit of an inconsistency in some chart. I'll have to double check my my answer to make sure I've taken the right answer. Thank you for that. Cool. Yeah. I think there might be an array or ARR.array. Yes, sir, yeah. Let's have a look here. Array.count returns the number of elements in the sequence. So you're saying there might be a length, is there? I think so. There is a length. Total number of elements. That's interesting. Array dot length. So that's how you get the length of an array. That's interesting. Huh? Here we go. So a or or dot length is how you get the number of elements. And uh, for a list, it's l dot count. Well, that's a bit of an inconsistency. That annoys me. <laughs> Same thing in Java. In Java, size length. You know, in, in those in. In languages, some languages use size, some languages use count, and some languages use length. The only way to know which one it is is code completion and then look up the list of methods to figure out whether it's size, count, or length. It's annoying because strings use one and uh, arrays use another one in, in, uh, in Java. <coughs> All right, Mr. Art, anything else from yesterday's? Do, do we need to know about casting? Yeah. Sure thing. So casting is all about converting from one data type to another. All right. So sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't need it. When do you need a cast? Um, yeah. Let's do. There's loads of situations where casting is required, and then the situations where casting is not required. Let me go int i and float f, and I'll just assign some values here. It doesn't really matter what the values are. So, first of all, if I want to take the value held in f and I want to copy it into i, do I need a cast? No. To convert from a float to an int, do you need a cast? How many people say no? How many people say yes? Yes is habit. You do. To convert from a float to an int. The reason why is because you could have something like this. Float f. 20.9. You don't need it in C, by the way. In C, it's an implicit cast. Right, so it just does the conversion for you. 
So you do 20.9 F, okay? That's my float. Now if you want to go I equals F, you'll get an error. Okay, cannot implicitly convert a float to an int because you're chopping off the bit after the decimal place. So the C sharp compiler is warning you about that and it's not letting you write your program. So in order to get around that, you include a cast to say, yeah, I know I'm losing the bit off from the decimal point, but I want to do it anyway. Yeah. Could you do it the other way? Could you uh, cast i as a float? Uh, no, because its type is an int. So on, on the other hand, if you were changing from, you could do this. Okay, get rid of that one. That's the first time you need a cast. Certainly to, okay, so if you want to write sets of rules, rule number one, converting from a float to an int requires a cast. Converting the other way doesn't require a cast. F equals I, as far as I remember, yeah. doesn't require a cast. Why is that? Because you're not losing anything. Because you're not losing anything, yeah. A float can hold the same value as an int, so you're not losing anything, so there's no risk in doing the conversion. So converting from an int to a float doesn't require a cast. Next thing, um, a double. So converting from, same thing applies for doubles, all right? But also, if you want to convert from um, F equals D, past, converting from a double to a float. How many people say cast? How many people say no cast? You have to say one or the other, otherwise you're off the course. <laughs> so how many people say cast? How many people say no cast? The answer is cast. The reason why this needs a cast is because a double takes 64 bits, a float takes 32 bits. So the potential is that you have a really huge number that you're trying to fit into a place that it won't hold, so that won't hold it. So converting from a double to a float does require a cast. All right, so there's rule number two. A double to a float requires a cast. On the other hand, F equals D. Sorry, that's the one we just did. D equals F. How many people say this needs a cast? How many people say it doesn't need a cast? And it doesn't have a cast, doesn't need a cast to win at this time. Because you're taking a small, you know, four byte number, you're fitting it into eight bytes, so you're just going to have plenty of extra room to hold the number that's not going to be used, but it's 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 capable of storing the number. <coughs> Alright? So that's I don't know, fourth rule, converting from a float to a double does require Sorry, converting from a float to a double doesn't require a cast. So the next thing then is converting between these and strings, and strings and these. So um, to convert between, we'll say, an int and a string, uh, s equals i. Does that work by itself? Can I implicitly convert type int to string? So to convert from an integer to a string, there's a method of using string. called convert. Yeah, I think you could do that. Dot two string. Is there a method called convert? Yeah, there's a convert dot two string convert inside the program. Uh, can you do s dot convert? Is it? Oh, possibly. Or, or maybe it's y dot s convert. Is it? convert. S equals convert dot, and you can change whatever you want. That's interesting. Uh, and you just... Uh, oh, interesting. Look at that. I never knew that. Cool. So you can go two by two car, two string. Interesting. So you can... Well, we say, what What? what if you just did uh, two, two string? Two string. And then you pass in, I guess there's overloaded versions of it. Look at that. So you can pass in an I like that. All right, that's another way to do it. The way I normally do it is just use the two string. Yeah. To do the other way around, to convert from an int to um, to from a string to an integer, uh, you need to go s equals the string six. And I want to convert that to an integer. You go i <coughs> equals i equals s is not going to work. Uh, I don't think a cast works here either. Yeah, a cast doesn't work there either. So the way to convert a string to an integer is to use, this is the way, I, I guess that convert thing would probably work as well. Yeah, I use int.parse. <coughs> 
So that parses the string, and then, you know, because it's ASCII codes and it's stored in it, it, in for integers, it's going to be stored as a two's complement number. So there's a job of work involved in converting from the ASCII codes or the Unicode values into the uh, two's complement format. So that's one way to do it. I wonder, can you do it the other way? Uh, I equals convert dot two uh, int, two int 16, two int 32. Yeah, so that works as well. Cool. All right, I'll have to go back and rewrite that multi-choice question, I think. Is there something I just learned? So that's casting. The other thing about casting is you use casting to convert um, from a base class to a derived class. That's another example of when you would use casting. If you have a base class called entity, and your instance is of the base class, and you want to convert it to one of the subclasses, if it is one of the subclasses and if it's legitimate to do that, you can't, for example, change a bullet into a player or a bullet into a tank, but you can change an entity into a bullet if it's a bullet already, if it's uh, instance is a bullet, etc. Right? So you can downcast as well, but you can't. You don't need to upcast, but you can upcast if you want, but you don't need to. Okay, that's casting. Is that all right? Could you do an example of that for you? Yeah, sure thing. I'll do, I'll do an example of the upcasting and downcasting, right? So I have this namespace here, class A, uh, int A, all right, and then class B colon uh, A, <coughs> int B. All right, so now I've got two classes. I've got class A, class B, I'm going to make this public just for the hell of it. So, not that I'm going to use these anyway. Does everybody understand this bit? So I've got class A, which has got a private field, uh, sorry, public field, and class B colon A means A gets everything, B gets everything that A has. Does A get everything B has? No. It's a one-way thing. Okay, so this means that class B gets everything that class A has. So class B also has a field called A, doesn't it? Yep. So the upcasting and downcasting thing on the polymorphism, just for the hell of it, I'll show you what I mean by the polymorphism thing. Let's make another class, which also extends class uh, A. I'm going to call this class C. Okay, so now I have two classes that extend A, which are called B and C. And we could do something like this. Uh, I'll show you the upcasting thing, right? A, A equals... New uh, B. Okay. So what we have here is A's type is A, but its instance is B. Okay. And this is okay. This is like saying that a dog is a mammal. So therefore, when you're creating a mammal, it can also be a dog. Okay. So this is legit. Now, if I want to get access to the field that's in B. If I want to go A dot, you see it only shows me A. And the reason for that is because the compiler doesn't know that this has happened. This could be in an if statement or a while loop. You know, this may or may not ever happen. So it doesn't know that this A has also got a B, even though it does, because its instance is a B. So in order to get access to the B, you need to do the downcast thing. So you need to go A, which I know is also of type B. So that's the cast dot, and then it will show me the A and the B. So that's downcasting. That's changing the type of A into a B. And it's okay to do that because it is a B. On the other hand, you can also write this. All right, the compiler won't give you any warnings with this. But what will happen when you go to run your program? Command uh, minus, move out. When you go to run it, you'll get a class cast exception. There you go. Invalid cast exception. Yeah, it's not okay. You can't change from a, you can't change this from you can't cast you know this A instance to a C because it isn't a C. I've created it as a B. Is that all right? So you can't do that. On the other hand, that other cast is okay. That one will work just fine. Because that's okay, because 
so I created it as a B. So that downcast in this example is okay. The downcast is something that it, it, it isn't created as is not okay. Now, polymorphism. A, A equals new B. You can also go A equals new C. And that's okay, because they've got the same base class, so they're the same type. Okay? So this is me uh, using polymorphism. A has changed from a B to a C. And we do the dogs and cats example, and the vehicles and bicycles and cars and things. And think about that, you know, but I'm, I'm just doing it in a really simple kind of a, um, you know, A's, B's, and C's. So you can see, separated from the concept, this is how the language works. All right? Is that okay with the upcasting and the downcasting thing? Um, all right. Is that okay with everybody? Anyone <coughs> asking questions on that one? Okay, so the next thing I thought, well, is there anything else that you guys specifically want me to, to talk about? Or to do an example of? Constructor chaining. Constructor chaining, perfect. Okay. Constructor chaining. I got a class A here. Let's make a constructor for A, okay? Constructor is a method with the same name as the class. And uh, there's my A. And let's just say in this here, I'm going to make A equals to zero. So that's the default value for A in the constructor. I need to do that public. Public A. So now I've got a constructor which initializes to the value of zero. In fact, let's do this so that you can see because the default value is zero anyway. So let's make it its initial value of 10. Now, what I want to do here in B, so there's two types of constructor chaining. There's constructor chaining within the same class. In fact, let's do the constructor chaining within the same class, first of all. Public A. And let's say I have a version of this constructor that allows me to pass in the initial value for A. So you can go this dot A equals A. All right. In this one here, instead of going A equals 10, what I want is I want to call this constructor and pass in a value for it. So you just go this. <coughs> I hope it's this. Is it, is it this? Can anybody remember? I think it's this. Nope, maybe it's not this. Oh, no, hang on. I know. <coughs> Sorry, 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 my, my apologies. Constructor chaining number one. It's colon. Is it colon this? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Colon this. Uh, 10. Okay, yeah, that, that's the first example of constructor chaining. Right, so that means when you call this constructor with no parameters, it's also going to call this constructor and it's going to pass in the value of 10 for it. Now, just to be really clear about this, let's show you this constructor chaining in action. All right? A, A equals new A. All right? So there's a no argument constructor. Set a breakpoint there. And when you run the program, you will see that, you press F11 in here, it calls this constructor, and then that colon this chains, you know, so it actually calls the other constructor to make sure that the value for A gets set. Uh, I pressed F10 there instead of F11, so it stepped over it. So I'll run it again. So F11, F11, and you see that it actually calls this constructor first, and then it does this constructor. All right, and this is really the right way to make your classes by using constructor chaining. I have one constructor that does all of the work of constructing the object, and then just call that from the other constructors. And this is really good because um, it saves you duplicating code. Just by calling this 10, and then it will do this here. Is that all right, for everybody? The other type of constructor chaining is to make sure that the base class constructor gets called. And to do the base class constructor chaining, you use the word base. Public B, colon, base. Uh, and then it says there's two. Yeah, so let's do that one. And then you can go B equals 20. All right. All right. So what's going to happen here is all the constructors are going to get chained. So when you do public B and you construct this colon base, it's going to call this constructor 
this constructor is going to call this constructor. All right, so there's the this and there's the base. The two of them work together to implement constructor chaining between the base classes. And I'm going to set a breakpoint here and run the program F9, F5. So I'm going to press F11 to step into it. And you see, first of all, it jumps into here. Now it's going to do the call on base bit. And it's going to call this one. This one is going to call the base class uh, one argument constructor. And then it's going to jump out and do this bit. And then it's going to jump in and finally do this bit. All right, so that's how constructor chaining works. Is that OK with everybody? Anybody want to ask any questions about that? Um, do you want me to do something on pre-increment and post-increment? Because that's just a thing that tends to confuse people. Are you OK? Huh? Are you happy enough with it? Cool. All righty. Is there anything else then? Everybody happy? Maybe modulus, maybe. Sure thing. No problem. So modulus. You can just go int i equals 9. Well, the right question on modules. Yeah. Well, th there won't be a question specifically, but what I'll do is be something like this. Sets up a few variables, does some operations on them, and then prints them out, and you've got to figure out what's the output. So it will do things like pre-increment, post-increment, and modulus operations. And, and sometimes the, it will be something like this, int i, well, I've already got an i. It'll be something like int j equals 9. And it could be something like j uh, int and it could be something like p equals uh, plus plus j modulus uh, 5. So what's the value for p going to be after that operation? It'll be those type of questions. It'll do a few little different things. So the value for j after that operation is going to be 10. All right, because plus plus or it doesn't matter where you put it, it changes the value for j. So the thing there is, which value for j does it use to do the modulus operation? And that depends on whether you do pre-increment or post-increment. In this case, we're doing pre-increment, right? So that means it adds the value to j first, and then does the modulus operation, which is pre-increment. So j is the value of 10 when you do percentage 5. 10 percentage 5 is 0. All right, so it's 5 into 10 is uh, 0, is, is, is uh, twice and no remainder. All right. On the other hand, if I was to do something like this, in fact, if I just change it, right, you know what, just to prove it, I'll, I'll set my breakpoint there and I'll just prove it. So I think the value after this is going to be P is 0, okay? So we'll debug, stop debugging, hit F5. Hit F5 to run through there. So P should have the value of 0, and it does. All right, can everybody see that? So P takes the value of 0, J takes the value of 10. All right, the other possibility then is that I do my plus plus J like this. And this is what we call post increment. So what happens here is it uses the old value of J uh, for this calculation. So this is going to take 9 percentage 5, 9 modulus 5. And then after it's done that, it will add 1 to j. So it uses the j, old value of j, does the modulus first, and then <coughs> adds the 1 to j. So the value for j after this is going to be 10, again, j. Yeah. And the value for p this time is going to be 9 modulus 5, which is going to be 4. All right, so we'll run it just to verify that. So p should have the value of 4, and it does, and j has the value of 10. All right, everybody. Okay, let's leave it at that for today. If there's anything else, just fill out the, the Google Docs, you know, link, and Mark can do some stuff in the tutorial tomorrow for you.